Okay. Um, I really appreciate everybody joining us today. We are going to move pretty fast. Uh, there will be a time for question and answers towards the end. <coughs> I am trying to get my PowerPoint up and running. I don't do PowerPoint as a general rule. I still use an old antiquated thing called thematic outline um, that I used when I taught. And I think you can either do resume slideshow or just go up to the slideshow and do from beginning. It's not responding. Okay. Yeah. I Okay, let me try that. It's kind of frozen, so let me see if I can. Or maybe close down PowerPoint and open it back up or um, at the top. Yeah, there you go. Let's try that. Okay. So, and a couple of people are saying they're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Okay, once I get this up and running, I'm going to move back a little bit closer, closer to, the, to the microphone. Perfect. Okay, let's get started. Um, basically, what I'm wanting to do is talk a little bit about a process that's kind of unusual, kind of underdeveloped in higher ed, and that is doing non-academic program review or doing evaluation of administrative and student support services. Program review itself has its origins in, in the academic side of the institution where we have to periodically review our degree and certificate programs. Uh, hence the name program review, and in fact on the non-academic, maybe we should change it to non-academic departmental review. But the process basically is there to achieve the same goal, and that is to evaluate the performance of a department to ensure that, number one, the department is a necessary uh, part of the institution, <clears throat> and if it is, that we have uh, in place a system to ensure that they have the resources they need. We look at program review as part of institutional effectiveness. And here at SIPI, we basically say that institutional effectiveness is the set of processes and indicators that we have that allow us to use data to prove that we're effectively meeting the institution's mission. Hence, mission, institution, effectiveness kind of all go together. And so program review is one of those things that we use to use data. It has to be data driven uh, to demonstrate that we're achieving uh, what it is that we're here to achieve and um, that we're sustainable into the long term with our program. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the process in general. A lot of it comes down to how you how you define evaluation. What's the basis for evaluation of a student service unit or a non-academic unit that's general and flexible enough that it can be used across? We do program reviews for all student service departments at SIPI as well as all administrative departments. Uh, we've recently done these reviews for the, um, the library, um, tutoring department. We've also recently done, the most recent one we completed was the president's office. And we have basically the same criteria for evaluation for student services as we do for administrative departments. So it's whatever we're going to use to base our evaluation on really has to be general and generalizable you know, in, in different situations and for different departments. Again, the idea behind program review is that it is a systematic evaluation that looks at a multi-year time period and evaluates within a broader context than, say, assessment. And we'll get into the differences between program review and assessment as we go along. Assessment feeds into program review. So program review oftentimes is done on a uh, multi-year cycle. 
At SIPI, we do it once every five years. Every department, it's on a rotating basis. Multiple departments do it every year, such that over the course of five years, we will have had everybody go through the process. Now, we've had some new departments established and created in the last couple of years, so we're probably going to shift to a seven-year cycle. Some schools will even use a nine-year cycle. It's whatever works for your institution. So basically, why do we do this? What is it? It's systematic evaluation is what it is. It's evaluation for quality assurance and improvement. We want every department to make a case for themselves on their performance and their commitment to improvement. It's also evaluation to ensure resource efficiency. We have to make sure that if we're spending money on programs, we're spending it wisely. Uh, we have, for instance, a couple of years ago did a program review of our housing department, housing and recreation department. And what it found was that that is a very expensive department that was not performing to the standards that, that it needed to perform to. And as a result of this, we decided we have to do a new model, which would be either contracting housing out or going to, let's say, a student residential assistant model um, to bring the cost down while improving the student experience in housing. So it's really about ensuring that we're using our resources efficiently. And the third, and this is the most important for us, is to ensure that our departments are sustainable over the long term. If we're going to evaluate our departments and determine that this part department needs to be kept into the long term, we basically have to ensure that they have the resources to pull off their goals, to pull off their objectives, and their value-added functions to the college. The process itself that we use here at SIPI is that it is a mandatory process and that all departments and student services participate. We do it again on a five-year cycle and we're about to shift that to a seven-year cycle. The emphasis is on ensuring efficient sustainability. That's our priority for this process. And we treat this process as about half evaluation and half consultation. Nobody likes to be evaluated, but we all like to have a consultant sometimes step in and evaluate what we're doing and give us ideas. Uh, we basically tell the departments as they're going through this that when we pick an external reviewer to come in to guide the, the review team, that they're picking not only somebody to evaluate, but they're picking a paid consultant and that the institution will pay for this consultant for them. The consultation part of it is really valuable because it really relieves some of the anxiety that goes into this. But look, we're not bringing in an expert to pick you apart. We're bringing in an expert to consult with you. They understand your field. They understand, for instance, tutoring services, or they understand libraries with a president's office. We brought in the president of another two-year institution with an enrollment profile very similar to ours and that uh, we're hoping that this consultation, that this evaluation will also be a consultation and that it will basically link them up with somebody that they can, they can reference and that they can use uh, as a resource in the future. And we found that the external evaluators have been really good at keeping in contact with their counterparts here at SIPI. Uh, so the consultation part is what really helps us get the buy-in and the participation the willing participation. Really all this comes down to, and for every institution it comes down to, what's the basis for evaluation? Uh, and this is going to be done really on an institution by institution basis, but what I thought I would do is cover those areas that we use here at SIPI, and these are all built in to the uh, departmental program review template, the self-study template. And there are six. We want, in order to show that departments are, are sustainable, that these departments are contributing to the life or the vitality of the college, we want them to be able to demonstrate six things. First is that they have a culture of continuous improvement. Second is that they have a culture of evidence. That they plan for the future. That they're aware of their strengths and limitations. Whoops, there's one that's not in here, it's in the uh, diagram, it's in the illustration, uh, that they have adequate resources and that they understand their organizational context and impact. 
And what we're going to do basically for the next, I'd say, 30 minutes is run through some of these and discuss what they look like and how we evaluate them. Um, what I'd like to do is just talk, I want to jump back and forth between the presentation and the manual we use. For those that are interested in the manual, at the end we can make it available. Um, if you would like, I can even make the Microsoft Word version available and you can modify it uh, to your institution's needs. Um, but basically the six, the six basic pillars are things that every department should be able to demonstrate. Uh, that they're fulfilling. So let's run through those real quickly. The first is basically a culture of continuous improvement. We know that this is a really, really big thing with accreditors, but it's also really important for institutions that, that are looking to achieve excellence, a degree of excellence. Uh, continuous improvement, and I, one of the things that I do on a pretty regular basis, in fact, I just did it in a non-academic assessment kickoff last week, and I presented this, this same presentation uh, called the Simple Slide Framework for Non-Academic Assessment, is tried to focus on what really is assessment about. It's about continuous improvement. What is continuous improvement? It's this deep-seated belief that no matter what we do and how well we do it, we can always figure out a way of doing it better. Continuous improvement is actually the goal. The process to achieve continuous improvement is assessment. Um, but what we do here is we really preach continuous improvement first and foremost. Because people ask, how do you get your people to buy into assessment? They don't. People don't buy into a process. They participate and comply with the process but what they really buy into is the core value or principle. For assessment, that core value is continuous improvement, and it is a commitment to continuous improvement, and we show it through multiple stories and examples here of how continuous improvement has separated landmark institutions from everybody else. It's a simple but incredibly powerful tool that's been used in business and industry to remarkable success. It's the reason why, to cut short to the end of part of my presentation on the assessment process, it's the reason companies like Burger King, Wendy's, Jack in the Box, Whataburger can all produce better fast food than McDonald's, but none of them will ever catch McDonald's. Because of McDonald's commitment to continuous improvement, they refer to it as plussing, or they used to refer to it in their corporate literature as plussing. Continuous improvement is the, is the um, value, assessment is the process. How are departments using the assessment process to achieve continuous improvement? Can they make that argument? Continue, assessment really is a simple concept. We make it more complicated than it really is, but assessment really can be broken down into four things. It's about proving who we are as a department, what we do as a department, how well we did it, and what we need to do it better. And the process of defining who we are, we do in our mission statement, what we do, we define in our performance objectives, that goes into an assessment plan, how well we did it is the data-driven part, and that goes into our assessment reports, and then what we need to do it better will come from those assessment reports in terms of action plans. If we didn't meet our performance objectives, we produce action plans to figure out how to do what we do even better. So assessment itself is a really simple concept. It does involve assessment planning, assessment reporting, using assessment results. The last bullet is probably the most difficult, and that is we have to be able to reflect on it. Just because we're doing the assessment reports, just because we're filling out the documentation doesn't mean we're achieving continuous improvement. I can tell you that here at SIPI, certain departments have been doing assessment for a few years now and I don't think they're any better at what they do because of it. <clears throat> and this is where we really, and it's an uncomfortable exercise in some instances, but we have in the past asked departments annually, give us some reflection on your assessment. And now we're doing it in the program review. How are you actually using assessment to achieve continuous improvement? What I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to jump to the manual and show you how we're collecting the data for these types of things, or what we're using as, as evidence. So this is our manual. It's pretty neat 
clean, simple, it's 24 pages. Basically, it discusses what program review is, how it differs from assessment, uh, goes through our process, the pillars of, of performance that we evaluate, and then tells a little bit about which one, what each one of them is and how we know we're achieving it. And when we get down here a little way, we get to the actual template. And the template itself is, we try to keep this pretty neat, clean, and simple. All of the major headings are exactly, um, exactly what was in that six pillar diagram. With respect to a continuous improvement, we ask the department, give us your mission statement, or give us the SIPI mission statement, and then the um, strategic goals to which your mission statement aligns, and then give us your mission statement. What's your departmental vision statement? A vision statement should be an aspirational statement. And then we look at the performance objectives. And every department has um, five, give or take one give or take one, so it's usually about four to six. These are our main value-added functions that we offer to the college. We ask which ones actually in this time of transition and change in our institution could actually be transferred to another department. For instance, we've taken on a major student success initiative. What of those student success initiatives that my department is responsible for could actually be sent to a different department that's being established that could better handle it. Some things, for instance, IR has done, now maybe enrollment management, because enrollment management is a new department. Maybe they should be taking on certain performance objectives. Or what performance objectives do we really need that don't exist, and why don't those exist? Or are they things that are being accounted for by other offices? For instance, academic program review is a process here at SIPI that doesn't fall within the domain of the Office of Institutional Research Effectiveness and Planning, it's managed by a committee. I could make the argument that that should be a performance objective of this department is to provide support for the academic program review process. Those are the types of things that we want school uh, departments to think about as they do this. Then we get into how are they assessing their performance objectives. What kinds of data, what multiple sources of data are they using for each? We ask them to provide a copy of their uh, most recent five years of assessment results. These come out of Weave Online. We're a Weave institution. And then we want to know what big picture changes have happened because of assessment, which ones have been suggested but haven't been made. This one's important to us because it helps us see if there are any breakdowns in the system. Because in theory, when a department is able to prove that they need resources through the assessment process using assessment data, we have the responsibility to make sure they get those resources. And that's part of my job, too, in institutional effectiveness, is to serve as an advocate for those departments and fight for them to get the resources, not just from assessment, but program review also. And then we want to know, tell us how they're actually achieving continuous improvement. What does it look like? And this is one of the more fascinating boxes that we have uh, in this template. Because in some instances, departments are able to really reveal some interesting things. To some extent, they're saying, well, you know what? It's really changed us. Maybe the continuous improvement part hasn't been what we had hoped for. But it's forced us to think about data in ways that we've never thought about. It's forced us to really rethink how we contribute to this school or how we add value to the school and how we can actually prove that we're adding value to the school. So the data alone has been kind of a game changer for some departments. And though, so the responses here are really kind of interesting. So these are the types of indicators that we want departments to use that demonstrate that they have an emerging culture of continuous improvement within their department. Our next emphasis really is on um, a culture of evidence. And culture of evidence is a really interesting thing. Institutionally, when I got here to SIPI, there was no IR office. Uh, there had never been an institutional research office. And what they told me when I got here was, well, we've got a lot of data. We just don't use it. What a culture of evidence really is is about how we use data. 
The culture of evidence doesn't mean we have a lot of data and that we can throw facts and figures around. What it means is that we systematically incorporate data into our major decision-making processes. This is at the heart of assessment, at gen ed level, academic program level, course level, and non-academic level. It is all about evidence. With this program review process, both the academic and non-academic program review processes are about using data to justify what it is you want. Because we've had in the first few cycles of this, we've had that issue of departments saying or academic programs saying, these are the resources I want, but the data never really made the case. And so we can't really award them that data based, or can't really award them those resources based on the lack of data. Culture of evidence does mean, again, that we systematically incorporate data into our major decision making processes. And a really good culture of evidence is one that doesn't just limit it to assessment and program review processes. For instance, we had a few years ago, the safety and security department here was looking at slow response times to, to calls across campus. They looked at those response times. They were able to make the justification that they needed bicycles. They need to be able to patrol campus on bicycles to be able to get, because we're a very, we're a small college, but we're very, geographically dispersed and for them to be able to and they're at kind of a far end of the campus for them to be able to achieve desired response times they needed help and they use that data to actually justify the purchase of bicycles for the staff this wasn't done within the formal assessment process this was just where they identified a need and they came up with the data to justify it we like things like that. In fact, we love things like that. Those of us in institutional research love it any time a department is able to collect data, use that data to justify decisions, not just when we tell them they have to via some process, but when it becomes part of the way that they as a department think. We really like this. The question we want to know here from every department is how do we actually how do we actually support our decision making with evidence? <clears throat> what do we use? What kinds of, of data do we use to support decision making? Could be surveys. We do no elevens every other year. In alternative years, we do SESI. We also do the CENS. We do an annual graduate survey. These types of things allow us to capture satisfaction and usage of student services. Departments have their activity logs, their compliance reports. They can collect data through um, committee deliberations and, and things like that. So what we're wanting to know is what do we have that they use to actually support decision-making with? And then on top of that, how do they actively engage other departments to elicit any kind of feedback or any kind of additional data? Some departments do customized surveys. I've worked with the library. I have worked with the um, Housing and Recreation Department to, to do a survey of uh, dorm life and student satisfaction with the dorms. We do stakeholder focus groups. These are pretty common and they're becoming increasingly common. Do departments have point of service uh, surveys that they do? Do departments have suggestion boxes? How do they actually uh, engage other departments and other stakeholders here on campus to get feedback. We also do one every other year. We do an employee satisfaction survey where employees who have engaged a particular department are given the opportunity to evaluate the quality of service. And we use the serve qual uh, discipline for service quality uh, to define our indicators. And then we come up with an overall satisfaction measure. And we use that pretty regularly in assessments for departments to assess satisfaction, any satisfaction related uh, performance objectives. But we also do that in years when, we also do it in years when they're not necessarily assessing a satisfaction objective. So what it, at this point, basically we're asking what evidence do you have? Now what we wanna know is how are you actually using that evidence? Because can they actually show it? Because what we've had with these program reviews in the past is we've had departments say, well, the college is collecting 
Noah Levitt and Fessy and Sense Data, and they do a graduate survey, and we do the employee satisfaction survey, and we do a dorm survey, a residential life survey. We do all of these different surveys. We do all these different focus groups, but they're never able to explain how they actually use any of that to make decisions on or to justify decisions. This is really, really important. In fact, we had a, a site review from the Higher Learning Commission in 2013, and one of the comments that really resonated with the committee, and they even put this in our evaluation report, was our librarian told them. I understand libraries. I understand how libraries work. I've worked in libraries. I know what this library needed when I got here, but I'm apprehensive about requesting those resources this library needs until I have the data to justify them which is really the way we want every department thinking. We need to be able to justify the use of resources with evidence. And so a lot of departments here collect evidence, but it's like they told me when I first got here, we've been collecting data, we just don't know how to use it. And that's part of my responsibility within institutional research is to help people not only collect data, but figure out how to actually use that data to support decision making. So what I'd like to do is once again jump to the uh, manual. And here we ask them to discuss the types of data. Now the, the, the self-study template here looks kind of like a laundry list, but actually what we're asking for is we're asking them to discuss a lot of things. Not just list, but discuss. We want introspection. We want introspective narrative. And as departments fill this out, they submit multiple drafts to me, and I help go through this, and I help tell them, you're not making your case, you are making your case, what have you. Um, but one of the things I do is try to ensure that they're able to justify, that they're able to, to um, introspect and make a, an adequate case for themselves. And here, basically, I, I want to know, tell me, discuss it with me, the types of data you use and where they fit into decision-making within your department. Discuss the kind of performance data that they use, their activity logs and compliance reports. How do they go out of their way to get suggestions and incorporate those suggestions from colleagues and clients? And then discuss how they actually use that data with specific examples. This is where a lot of them really struggle. This is where a lot of them really struggle is that, again, they collect the data, they don't use it. I need to know this to be able to help provide them better support. This next step is a different one for us. This is brand new, and I just put it in this cycle, and it's all about planning for the future. SIPI is one of those schools, and it's like a lot of schools, in that we're really comfortable and we're really good sitting around a table talking about the future, we struggle when it comes to formally planning for the future and implementing those plans. And basically, what we're wanting departments here to do is to begin developing a culture of planning at this institution. We believe we're making progress in developing a culture of assessment. We believe we're making progress in developing a culture of evidence. Now it's really time for us to begin developing a, a culture of planning. And that really begins by, by understanding what our philosophy for planning is, what goes into the decisions, why we plan, how we plan, and for what we plan. And then can we actually demonstrate that? We do have a strategic plan here at SIPI, and the strategic plan is, is it's pretty neat, clean, and simple. With strategic planning, we're asking that departments really collaborate with one another. Strategic initiatives are not about doing what you already do. They're about taking the institution in a different direction. Strategic plan is about getting us from achieving our mission to achieving our vision, where that vision is very ambitious. And the old saying goes, you keep doing what you've done, you keep getting what you got. And if you want what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. For us, planning is all about defining our vision at both the institutional level and then coming up with initiatives that are going to help us get there one year at a time in this five-year plan. We're now asking departments not only to demonstrate your participation and your commitment to strategic participating in the strategic planning process, 
we want departments to now begin thinking about how they're going to plan at the departmental level. And this represents some really radical thinking for us here at SEBI. My own department went through a program review a couple of years ago before this section was in here. We just put it in this last year and decided, you know what, we can't ask people to be doing something we're not doing ourselves. So we're now in the process of developing uh, what for us is going to be a seven-year institutional research effectiveness and planning master plan. We need to be able to look at what SIPI's Office of Research Effectiveness and Planning should look like seven years from now so that we can begin putting the processes in place and, and defining and fulfilling the necessary steps to get us there one year at a time over the next seven years. This is a fascinating process. Um, because there aren't, I can't find any schools really that have developed an institutional research master plan. Schools do have facilities master plans, academic master plans. Uh, some will have an IT master plan or technology master plan. But we believe every department should be able to think out what their department should look like five, seven, ten years down the line and begin formally planning to get from where they are right now to where they need to be in five, seven, or, or ten years. A lot of these discussions came up when we did the program review for the library. And we discussed with the librarian what the SIPI library looked like when she got here five and a half years ago, what it looks like now, and what it needs to look like five years into the future. Well, that five years into the future, she had a really good grasp of where it was when she got here and where she's brought it to at this point. So we knew what SIPI Library version 1 looked like and Library version 2 looked like. But then the question came up, what should SIPI Library version 3 look like? That brought up some really interesting discussion, and it was discussion that we really couldn't fulfill in a single day. But it was very clear, we have to begin developing master plans at the departmental level. So we're asking departments to begin thinking about that. So for planning for the future, we want to know what really is your philosophy? How do you actively plan? How does the process work? Is it a participatory process? Is it a ground up process? How does it support institutional uh, strategic planning? I've told departments, you're going to have to include a copy of your, develop, your departmental master plan. If it's not complete, give us what you got. Give us the framework and let's evaluate that framework. The uh, evaluation team actually could help provide some guidance here, especially the external evaluator could provide some really good guidance on refining and continuing to develop that master plan. Then we get to how well each department is actually participating in the strategic plan, how deeply they're involved. What we'll find is that there are some departments that basically run and hide when it comes to producing strategic initiatives. They haven't participated in the plan. They're not really helping move the institution forward in that respect, helping us move from mission to vision. So what we need to do is get departments to actually begin thinking this out. Next step for us is to look at their strengths and limitations. And this is a fascinating piece for us because SIPI is an unusual college. We're a federal institution. We're run by the U.S. Bureau of Indian Education, which is part of the U.S. Department of the Interior. We have one other college, our sister school, Haskell Indian Nations University that's like us. And I think that we have at SIPI a tendency to look a lot at what Haskell does, the other federal uh, Department of Interior institutions, when in fact what we probably need to be doing is looking more at what other aspirational colleges are doing. What are some of the really good community colleges, Richland College in Dallas, uh, Lone Star Community College, Johnson County Community College, Sinclair, Miami-Dade, what are some of those schools doing? What are our strengths and limitations? Um, this really forces us to look at what the norms are in our field. So when I look at the strengths and limitations of institutional research, I have to have a reference point, and that reference point is the way that other institutions, IR offices, are performing. We 
use this basically to do a SWOT analysis. We examine our internal strengths and weaknesses. We examine our external opportunities and threats. And when we do this, it's not a question of can you take your strengths, put them on one side of the scale, take your weaknesses, put them on the other side of the scale, and then hopefully they balance. It's really about can we even discern, clearly discern what our strengths are and how we're working to capitalize and preserve those strengths. And can we identify what our weaknesses or limitations are and what we're doing to work our way around those limitations and over those barriers. What we're finding is that some departments aren't even fully aware of what their strengths are or what their limitations are. By the way, the use of the word limitations is something that we have to deal with here as a federal institution because sometimes our weaknesses are limitations. Hey, for instance, because we're federal, we find that facilities has a lot of red tape around them. They're wrapped in red tape. For instance, we have to, as part of the federal government, we have to buy American. The problem is gardening gloves, which facilities need, are all made in China. I work in the Office of Institutional Research. I need to be able to survey employers of our students. I need to be able to survey the community, our stakeholders. But because we're federal, we have to comply with the Reduction in Paperwork Act, which means that for me to, for the federal government to collect data from the outside world, from the rest of the public at large, I have to go through a process. I have to take my surveys. I have to submit them to the Office of Management and Budget in Washington, D.C. to post to the Federal Register for 90 days of public evaluation and comment. And about a year later, they may tell me, yes, you can do the survey but you have to use this control number for the next three years and you have to put the estimated time burden. The same types of things you see on a passport application, for instance. But it's red tape. We have a lot of limitations. And this is an opportunity for me to say, what am I doing to figure out ways of achieving what I need despite those limitations? So we ask, can you clearly discern our strengths can we clearly discern our limitations or our weaknesses? And what are we doing to work our way out around those? This makes for some great discussion. And oftentimes things that departments really are on top of, they just never really mapped it out. <clears throat> on a reference point, again, in looking at what our strengths are, our strengths relative to the same types of institutions. We've had some instances where departments here are I'll give you a couple of examples. Because we're part of the federal government, we've had, for instance, safety and security and facilities ask, can we look at having an evaluator for our process from uh, Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security, or from Indian Healthcare Services? And what we told them is, no, they need to be from higher ed. They need to be from one of your counterparts of the higher ed institution because we're not the Department of Homeland Security and we're not a hospital. It needs to come from higher ed. We really need to understand what defines strength in a department based on the norms for institutional research, for facilities, for tutoring, for running a library, as well as the limitations. So let's real quickly jump back to the manual and let's look at what we do here. Basically compared to the same department and other institutions, identify strengths of the office and discuss what your department does to capitalize on the strength. Part of our office is the fact that we have people with, we have no newbies when we did this process. We have people who all had at least 15 years experience in the field in this office. And additionally had experience in other areas of the college. Some worked in IT and financial aid. Some have taught before. And so we have people who really are able to help in various aspects in terms of grant evaluation, things like that. So that's one of the strengths. We also have strength in this department of having at least two of us who played very active roles in data support for accreditation at other institutions. And so when it comes to accreditation, this department really is very, very heavily engaged and can contribute to, to any of the Higher Learning Commission's five criteria for accreditation. We're also wanting to know what, compared to other institutions, some of the limitations or weaknesses are and what we're doing to find solutions 
in spite of those weaknesses. This gets into some really interesting discussion. Uh, for instance, in institutional research, there are instances where we may not be able to administer the survey, but we may be able to collaborate with our Board of Regents, which is non-federal, um, to do the survey provided it fulfills one of their own departmental goals. So what we have to do here is really think hard, not just about what we're doing well and what our limitations are, but what we're doing to protect those things we're doing well and what we're doing to address the limitations we have. Then we go into the, and so the first two questions really are about the internal strengths and weaknesses. The next two are about the external opportunities and threats. What do we see coming down the road? It could be budget issues. It could be potential budget cuts. It could be initiatives, for instance, in state-funded performing formulas and things like that that may change the way we do what we do. Um, we want departments to think some of these things out. For safety and security, for instance, there's been a lot of emphasis now placed on campus security with the number of active shooter incidents that have happened on college campuses. So we need to really think these things out and be able to discuss them. The next piece for us is resource adequacy. This one, really what we want to know is do you have the resources to fulfill the basic functions of your job? This isn't about do you have what you, do you have the resources that you would have in a perfect world? This doesn't incorporate wish lists. This is simply, do you have the resources to continue doing what you need to do on an annual basis? And what we really want them to look at is human resources. Do you have the staff? Are those staff qualified? Are they adequately trained? Do you have the technological resources, the hardware, the software solution? Do you have the office space, the physical resources and equipment? And then do you actually have the budget resources? to do what it is your department needs to do. And what we want to know basically is how adequate are those at helping you achieve what it is your office is supposed to do. Uh, one of the things that strategists look for historically is resource gaps, performance gap, or re resource gaps, performance gaps, inflection points, and undertow problems. Here we're addressing the resource gaps as they lead to performance gaps. If a department is unable, for instance, to hire enough faculty, one of our academic divisions or departments is unable to hire enough faculty, uh, full-time faculty, they may find that they're not actually able to do the assessment of their academic degree and certificate programs up to standards on an annual regular basis because they're relying on adjuncts and the adjuncts may or may not be committed to the, to the process. So do they actually have the necessary resources? Let's jump back to the manual. Let's look at how we're asking this. Basically, what we want them to do with human resources, don't give us resumes, just list the department personnel, tell us who they are, how long they've been here, and a summary of those resources. Do we have people in institutional research effectiveness and planning who have longstanding um, background, career background, and have the necessary training to be able to do what an Office of Research Effectiveness and Planning does. Do we have the necessary facilities, equipment, and technology? For instance, we found with us that we have a massive office issue in that most of us are in one building, but one person is in a totally different building and she has a public easement going through her office. You have to go through her office to get to a financial analyst's office. Why is that a problem? Because she's handling all kinds of sensitive records. And if she's out, but people still have to be able to get to the financial analyst, they may pass right through her office with, with records, with highly sensitive records. So uh, this was really a case of inadequate uh, facilities for institutional research. Those records need to be in a lockable, in lockable equipment cabinets, in a lockable office, in a lockable research suite. That itself in a lockable building. So we 
our review showed that we really didn't have the necessary um, facilities. In, additional, in addition to that, we look at the technology. Do we have the hardware? Do we have the software? Do I have the hardware and software I need to do statistical analysis? Do I have the hardware and software I need to do um, strategic planning? Do I have what I need to, to do focus groups, online surveys, and things like that? Does every office have what it takes to do their basic job? And then finance and budget. This is where we don't just want them saying we're underfunded. We want to actually see the budget. We want to actually see a copy of their annual budget each for the past five cycles. We manage the budget allocations through SPOL or strategic planning online. We really like that. Uh, before that, we use something called web budget. But departments have copies of their budgets. And what we want to see is what those budgets have looked like and where there have been underfunded areas where we've had to scramble to get them the resources in a stopgap measure throughout the year. And the final piece, and this one is actually pretty simple, is this notion of organizational context and impact. Every organization has an org chart, and that's the one on the left. And the org chart basically is just to delineate the chain of command. But on top of that, <coughs> We actually have an invisible org chart that shows which departments, although they may not be connected in that chain of command, actually have important functional relationships. And we can actually use this to see where the functional relationships don't exist. For instance, on the right may show that, let's say this is an academic division, that that academic division doesn't necessarily have a functional formal relationship with student services that it should, or under college ops, it doesn't have a functional formal relationship that it should have with facilities for the purpose of facilities planning. Basically what we want departments to do is look at the org chart and say, okay, let's forget the chain of command pieces, let's look at these amend let's look at these kind of invisible relationships between your department and other departments in the org chart. Who do you deal with? Who do you not deal with that you should? For instance, when we did a program review of the dorms of housing, we found that the housing department has a very strong functional relationship with um, safety and security. In fact, safety and security have annex offices in the dorms, and that's really important. But we found that the dorms didn't have a strong functional relationship with tutoring, which they probably should have. So what we're doing when we're talking about organizational context and impact is where are those relationships across the org chart? And how are those working? What works about those? What doesn't? And where are those relationships? Or where are the relationships that should be in place that aren't? And from this part of, of, the, uh, of the program review process, we've actually found that we've needed to force formal programs uh, that really force the collaboration between departments. But we've also found in some instances that we've needed to put departments on committees that they're not currently on. For instance, when we did the, the program review of information technology department, they really have to have a strong level of engagement with academic programs, with student services, with the dorms, um, with a number of people across campus, a number of stakeholders. And so one of the recommendations was that a representative be placed on the president's cabinet, which oversees college operation issues on campus. So what we're wanting to do is have every department really think about it less rigidly formal chain of command like and more broadly. What does our functional org chart look like? Not the chain of command org chart, not the legal org chart, but the functional org chart look like. Who are we dealing with and, and what's working well and what isn't working in those functional relationships? And what relationships should exist but don't. This is really all about helping us break down silos. So when we go back to the manual, we get into the, show us where you are in the org chart. Give us a copy of the org chart, highlight it. 
and discuss coordination of activities or the functional relationships with other departments, those that work, those that aren't working. and those that, that really don't exist but need to be put into play. That is, for the most part, the basics of our, of our process. Um, we look at those six pillars. We feel like if, an or, if a department can make a case for its performance in this area, um, then they can effectively evaluate themselves. So we have the process is very simple. Departments do a departmental self-study. This is done with a template. We're looking now at we review because we think I've done a demo with the people at Centriva. We've looked at we review and we feel like our template could be placed into we review very neat, clean, and simple. But we tried to keep it pretty simple, six things to address. And all six really need to be introspective evaluation. So departments do the self-study. We hold a one-day site visit with an evaluation team, and then they produce a report. The report goes to our leadership, and it has to be tied directly into institutional planning and budgeting. We do evaluation by a team. And an evaluation team, there are three ways of doing it. You can have a team of nothing but internal employees, a team of nothing but external evaluators, or a blended. We do the blended model. We have a three-person team. The lead of that team is a content expert from an aspirational institution, and then we have two internals. There are instances where departments do multiple things like research and effectiveness. We had two externals. One was the director of institutional research from Tyler Junior College in Texas. The other was the director of institutional effectiveness from Richland College, and then the internal was the acting vice president of college operations. He needed to be there to keep the internals in check based on the fact that we're a federal institution and there are certain things that as a federal institution we can't do, like buying gardening gloves from China or doing surveys just off the cuff, immediate, without going through the necessary process, government process and protocol. So the blended evaluation team works really well for us because we have people who understand the organization context, but we have the leaders of this process who really are content experts in the field. We pay them a fee, um, a consulting fee. The consulting fee is usually about 1000 to 1500 plus we cover their travel. <clears throat> they will agree to review the self-study two weeks before a site visit. They will do the site visit. It's an all-day visit. We have structure to that. It's in the manual. And then within two weeks uh, of the end of the site visit, they're supposed to produce the evaluation report. The evaluation report will include their recommendations and feed directly into our budget planning. So what I want to do, and I know I don't have much time here, I want to real quickly show you what some of the templates look like when we complete them and what the evaluation reports look like. So I'm going to go to one that we did for institutional research. Institutional research, it was neat, it was clean, it was simple. Here's the mission statement, the goal we align with. Here's our mission statement, our vision statement, our performance objectives, and then we get into discussion. We get into some degree of introspection and narrative. And the whole thing itself, when all is said and done, should be about 20 to 25 pages. We do not have a section in here saying, give us a general introduction to your department, give us the whole history of your department, because what happens is that you'll get multiple pages of basically blaming all of the department's problems on the past leadership of that department. We don't want that. We want to know how you're performing in this current context, what's working and what's not working. And within these evaluation reports, we also will have them include the necessary appendices. I'll give you an example from the library. The library, this is the library's program review evaluation report. And when we get to um, the appendices, they produce their assessment report. It's a detailed assessment report right out of WEED. In other sections, they're providing additional data. For instance, let me scroll down. A lot of assessments out of the library. They look at uh, 
what they're doing in terms of, of um, database, the databases they provide, the usage of those databases. They look at circulation statistics, what they spend in managing the circulation. They provide a fair amount of, of data. They provide their library guidelines. They provide the budget data and their financial data. Let me see if I can get to that. Some of that. Here's where they maintain financial data. This is called a top account. And every department is going to do the same. Now, at the end of the process, departments, let me show you what an evaluation report looks like. The evaluation template is also in the, um, in the manual. It's neat, it's clean, it's simple. The three judges score, they weight the criteria, they score on those criteria, and we come up with an average, and the average tells us that the library is doing pretty good work. We provide an analysis of their strengths, we provided an analysis of their uh, challenges and limitations. This all comes from the evaluation of the self-study and the site visit. And then what are our recommendations to for them to improve their performance? And actually this was, you know, this was two groups. And we go through our recommendations and then we actually provide some research and some numbers. We've determined that tutoring basically needs to align itself with professional associations to provide them resources and guidance on peer tutor training and things like that. And they need to begin learning about supplemental instruction and start shifting that direction in the future. So we provided them the following resource recommendations. We're also asking that the tutors be increased uh, their salary be increased uh, from what in the government's a GS-5 scale to a GS-7 scale because uh, a tutoring department here in some instances has been a, a revolving door. If we're going to bring in tutors, have these people bring in master's degrees, we probably need to pay them better. And so we actually get into exactly how much that would cost in terms of salary between a GS-5 employee and benefits for a GS-5 employee. and those were our recommendations that went to the leadership. Those recommendations are actually being fulfilled right now. Uh, tutoring has just reworked the position descriptions and upped the positions from GS-5 to GS-7 positions. So a lot has come out of this process up to this point. We've had instances where, like I said, with, with housing, we decide that the model is inefficient and has to be replaced. And a total new model is now being developed. In other instances, we're asking that departments better document what they do. And in other instances, we're asking departments basically expand it, join professional associations. Our uh, facilities department, uh, for instance, really needs to be a part of, of facilities professional associations. And there are two. One is K through 16, and one is just higher ed only. They need to be a part of those. They need to be attending those conferences. They need to be networking with their counterparts. So that, in a nutshell, is the process. <laughs> I really apologize for taking this all the way to noon. Um, we do have a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Hummingbird. That was really informative and practical and helpful. Um, is, is it okay if I read you a few of the questions that we got? Absolutely. The, there were several requests for both your PowerPoint and the uh, the manual. Um, lots of those okay. people really thought that looked helpful. Um, the other one I got here: uh, How long does it typically take for units or departments to complete the non-academic program review? So, kind of, what's the timeline? Great question. And let me go back to the manual. And again, I'm hoping that you all will. Re re Fire me an email, and I'll be happy to, um, to send you a copy of the manual. It does detail exactly what the timelines are for this process. And let me show you where. Okay. It's got a lot of questions and answers, um, what to expect from the, how to complete the, the study, what to expect from the site visit. Here's an example, for instance, of, 
of the uh, agenda for the actual site visit. The team meets for an hour in the morning to discuss. They've already reviewed the self-study. Now they're to discuss that, figure out what areas they need clarification on, what questions they may have. They then will meet with the department for two hours, all of the department staff. They'll take lunch break. In the afternoon, we want them to meet with the president. And this is where they'll ask questions about organizational context and impact, usually. Then they review the physical facilities, and they may even want to look at some of the records that the department keeps. The team will meet again for an hour to discuss, and then they'll hold kind of an exit meeting with the department. This may be to clarify other issues and to let the department know what kind of sort of their major findings that will appear in the uh, in the evaluation report. We talk about then the completion of the report and their ability to provide um, comments and, um, and correct any um, errors of fact. We discuss how you pick the reviewer. We discuss how they're compensated, and they're compensated through my office. Uh, the degree to which the findings are actually binding. Uh, here's where we get into the process. Basically, departments begin the process on about November 1st, sometime in November. They will work on identifying an evaluator with my office, and my office is then responsible for reaching out, contacting those evaluators, discussing the process, explaining their roles, their responsibilities, their deliverables. For instance, we've got an academic department coming up. The academic department, uh, let's see, advanced ATE, advanced technical education, they're coming up. So in order um, to get facilitate this process, I worked with them. We identified a potential reviewer that was Martha Hogan, the executive dean at, uh, of the School of Engineering and Technology at Richland College, I went and visited her in person and we discussed it. She is very happy to participate. So we work together on that. I don't pick their evaluator for them, um, but I really do want to be able to vet their evaluator and make sure that this person has participated in this or that they understand the process and they know their role. That needs to get done in the spring. The review itself really should be prepared and finished, and this is usually done through multiple drafts, and I work with them sometimes to review the drafts and, and let them know where it needs to be strengthened, where there's data that they're sitting on that they could be using but they're not to support their case. That's done in April. And then the site visits are usually done in May. Sometimes they run a month late, sometimes they run even two months late. But we try to get them all done during the month of May, and it's just a one-day visit. The team then, during the month of June, will submit their final report. There will be a chance for the team to review that report, provide any feedback. It really needs to be a collaborative effort. We may also, based on our recommendations, ask the team to do some marketing research for, for cost of resources. And then we submit that report. So the whole process really doesn't take that long. Again, the program review evaluation report should be about 20 to 25 pages when it's complete, plus the appendices, and there can be a lot of appendices, a lot of appendices based on the types of data we collect. So for my department, I think it was about 20 pages, but the total including all the appendices was about 135 pages. Uh, <clears throat> the evaluation report is usually about 10 pages, and that's it. Uh, so it's neat, it's clean, it's simple, but it addresses what needs to be addressed to ensure that our departments are efficient and that they're sustainable. Does that answer that question? It does. Um, I've got a few more here. We'll just go for maybe four more minutes or so. I know uh, people are still listening, so uh, looks like everybody really wants to uh, hear a little more from you. This is another question. When you started non-academic assessment, how did you advocate your case? How did you overcome departmental natural resistance to provide evidences, especially when it indicates negative output? Part, this is kind of like, what, how do we get people to participate in assessment? Because when we first did non-academic assessment, nobody wanted to participate. Um, these types of things, they say, are ancillary. They're, that's not why I'm hired. I'm here to work on the budget. I'm here to do this, that, and the other. I'm not here to fill out these, all of these forms and write self-studies and, and do all of this kind of thing. 
my responsibility here is is to provide guidance, support, and assistance. Everything I can to help people get through the process as neat, clean, and simple as possible. Nobody wants to do this until they get through it and they realize that, you know what, the evaluation was the evaluation, but the consultation was really cool. And in many instances, I've had departments ask me, can we do this again? Can we do it again next year? Um, like with assessment, we basically tell departments, look, this is an opportunity to throw up the red flag on yourself and know that you're not going to be punished, but that the institution is responsible for giving you the resources you need to be able to do what you do even better. There has to be commitment from the executive offices of the college, especially the president's office, that we take this process seriously and if it uncovers the need for more staff, if it uncovers the need for more equipment, more training, and you can prove it with data, we're obligated to do what we can to get you those resources. In some instances, we may have to do it kind of on a staggered basis, but it's our responsibility to make sure that this department is sustainable by giving you the resources you need. And so when I do the assessment workshop or the assessment presentation, one of the questions that comes up at the very end of it is, what if we don't meet our performance objectives? Um, then it's up, you're not going to be punished for it. We know that from, from assessment. We don't punish people for not achieving student learning outcomes or achieving performance objectives. It's our responsibility because you've made a data-driven case for yourself that we do what we can to get you the resources to do what you do even better. And it's the same thing here. This is not presented as an opportunity for your department to be, you know, subject to death by a thousand paper cuts. This is an opportunity for your department to make the case to protect what you're doing well and to get the resources you need uh, to help you overcome the areas where your department is struggling and is not necessarily doing well. We need leadership by example, and that's why my office was one of the first to go through this process. And we shared our departmental self-study across the campus. I'll be happy to share it with some of you all. And we shared the evaluation report with other departments to see that, you know what, we survived this. It's really, really valuable in the end. This is a really wonderful tool once you actually get through it. But there is the apprehension because it's evaluation. The other thing we really needed, and I was, I was really glad we were able to get this done last year, was the president herself put her own office through this. I mentioned this once to the president of another college, and he said, you're kidding. You mean your president actually allowed that to happen? Our president was willing and eager to have her office evaluated too. It's leading by example. We really need the executive offices of the campus to be willing to take this on and go through it first and lead by example. But we found that participation is really good once we get the ball rolling. The tough part here is getting departments that can even identify external evaluators. And we've really struggled with that in some instances because we're such an insular institution and we have a lot of people who don't know their counterparts at any other college, let alone aspirational colleges. But part of this is I'm going to do as much lifting as I can, particularly with the data. I tell the departments I'm not here to, to set guidelines and then club you over the head with a stick if you don't meet those guidelines. I'm here to provide all the guidance, support, and assistance I can in helping you get through the process and making it meaningful. There have been a couple of requests. If you would be, um, are you comfortable sharing your email on the screen so that people can ask you some more questions as a follow-up to the webinar? We've got a lot of good questions here, but we are unfortunately out of time. Um, we'll leave that up. That's okay. It was all good stuff. Don't apologize. We we should have scheduled more time. <laughs> this was very very. I could be reached at Edward dot Hummingbird at B I E that stands for Bureau of Indian Education dot E D U. Uh, my college is SIPI, the Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute. SIPI F I P I dot E D U. You can also look me up that way. Look, use me as a resource. I know I'm busy, I've got a lot of stuff to do, but I'm willing to help anybody in any way that I can, especially from our lessons from this process, because I really didn't have time to get into that. We've learned a lot about ourselves as departments and as an institution as we've moved through this process.
the beauty of this is that this isn't even required by the Higher Learning Commission um, for non-academic departments, but we do it, program review that is, assessment is, program review not. We do it anyway because we believe that evaluation and consultation will make us better at what we do and give us the data we need to make a case for resources. So this process has really helped departments learn a lot about themselves and it's been wonderful for us and, and if the lessons we've learned, if the bumps and obstacles in the road that we've had to overcome can be of any, any help in others, um, let me know. I'm happy to be of whatever assistance I can. Thank you so much, Dr. Hummingbird. That was um, And if anybody very... wants a copy of the manual or the PowerPoint, let me know. If they want copies of any of our documentation. I'm not really at liberty to give out the departmental self-study or anything like that for other departments, but I think I probably could for my own. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share that. I want you all to see what this what this process actually um, produces, what its deliverables look like as well. And so there were, immensely, sorry, go ahead. We've been immensely pleased with the deliverables every time we've done this process. Again, thank you so much. We had so many wonderful questions and I will make sure to get those to you as well, Dr. Hummingbird, so you can see them and um, it sounds like people will contact you. Also, if you have questions, please feel free to contact me, Amber, here at Weave. Um, you will get a short survey after this webinar asking for your feedback, and that's another place where you can ask for copies of things if you need it. Um, Dr. Hummingbird, I'd be happy to help you with that. This was a wonderful webinar. Thank you so much. I think this is what I loved about it. It was very practical. It's things that people can put into effect and do to make change. Uh, it was just wonderful. We can't thank you enough. And it's easy. Yes, which you don't hear that very often, right? <laughs> it was very, very well, good. I want to thank everybody for participating. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. We will be doing more of these, and um, hopefully, you know, as you learn more from your process, Dr. Hummingbird, you would be willing to come back and do a part two. I think people would really enjoy it. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you everyone so much, and again, you will here the, uh, the you'll get the survey in your email and you can complete that and if you have other questions please reach out to either myself or Dr. Hummingbird and we'll get you what you need and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks Dr. Hummingbird. Thank you.